Good evening. Eh? This is the first night of our Vasa talks. Eh? And we are going to continue with the Majima Nikaya. But uh, I'd like to say uh, before we go into these suttas that uh, new Samaneras, uh, you should uh, know uh, that on the store there, the notice, uh, you see the yellow colored notice as instructions for new monks and new Samaneras. Uh. So when you're free, uh, you go and read there, you see instructions about uh, going on arms round and uh, proper conduct and all these things. Uh. So every day, you all go and uh, read and uh, get to know how to conduct yourselves. Uh. Mm. Now we're going to the suttas. Huh? Last year I uh, read the Majima Nikaya suttas huh? uh, up to sutta number 14. Huh? So tonight we're going to begin with sutta number 15. Huh? Uh, one thing I like to say huh, is that uh, I'm going to go through these suttas very fast huh? because of time limitation. Huh? Uh, every night probably you have to do two or three suttas, or even sometimes four suttas. So because of that, I'm not going to have enough time to explain in great detail these suttas. And these talks that I'm giving is just introduction to you all on these suttas. And if you listen to these talks, and at the same time, look at the books, uh, then you will uh, understand better. Uh. In fact, I see many of you without the books. Uh, you should have come here prepared with the books. Uh. Last year, when we did the Sanyuta Nikaya, a lot of people had the books ready. Mm. So, uh, maybe later you can get the books. Uh. You can ask somebody, your relative or somebody to get the book. Mm. So if you find that these talks are not so detailed, then you should uh, understand it's because of time constraint. When I did the first Nikaya, the uh, Anguttara Nikaya only gave one talk uh, of one hour per week. So I had a whole week to prepare. But now every night I have to give the talks. So I have to prepare the talks either in the morning or in the afternoon. So I don't have much time. Okay, now we come to Sutta number 15, Majima Nikaya. It's called the Anumana Sutta. Inference, that's the title. We're using this book by Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. The only thing is sometimes some of the words, I'm not so happy, I change a bit. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Venerable Maha Moglana was living in the Baga country at Sung Sumaragira in the Besakala Grove, the deer park. There he addressed the monks thus, Friends, monks, friend, they replied. The Venerable Mahamogalana said this, Friends, though a monk asked thus, Let the Venerable Ones admonish me. I need to be admonished by the Venerable Ones. Yet if he is difficult to admonish, and possesses qualities that make him difficult to admonish, if he is impatient, and, and does not take instruction rightly. Then his companions in the holy life think that he should not be admonished or instructed. They think of him as a person not to be trusted. I stop here for a moment. Huh? Maha Mughalana is one of the uh, very senior disciples of the Buddha. Huh? So sometimes he gives uh, Dharma talks to the other monks. Huh? The translation uh, here, uh, this uh, friend, uh, is Avuso. During the Buddha's time, the monks address each other as Avuso. Sometimes it's as translated as friend, like here. Sometimes it's translated as venerable. So, uh, or reverend. Uh. So here, venerable uh, Mahamogalana says, uh, even though sometimes a monk uh, asks, to be admonished, to be told his faults. 
Uh, but if he has qualities uh, that make him difficult to admonish, uh, then uh, the other monks uh, would be reluctant to admonish him. Uh, if he is impatient, does not take instruction uh, rightly. Uh, so, since it is difficult to admonish him, uh, other monks uh, do not want to admonish him. Uh. Now, in the uh, Vinaya books, uh, uh, in the Mahavaga chapter 1, uh, when a new monk comes to train under a teacher, uh, because a new monk uh, is supposed to spend five years under a teacher, uh, and uh, if he possesses certain qualities, uh, the teacher is supposed to dismiss him, uh, throw him out. Uh, if he possesses one of five qualities, uh, one is he does not have much faith in the teacher. Uh, Number two, uh, he does not have much respect for the teacher. Number three, he does not have much affection for the teacher. Number four, he does not have a sense of shame uh, towards the teacher. Uh, not much uh, sense of shame towards the teacher. Number five, he does not have much development or progress under the teacher. Uh, and the teacher is supposed to chase him away, uh, dismiss him. Uh, so... Uh, so that's why like uh, if a uh, certain monk uh, is difficult to admonish, uh, then others will not admonish him. Now the sutta continues. Uh, what qualities make him difficult to admonish? Here a monk has evil wishes and is dominated by evil wishes. This is a quality that makes him difficult to admonish. Again, a monk lords himself and disparages others. This is a quality that makes him difficult to admonish. Three. Again, the monk is angry and is overcome by anger. Number four, a monk is angry and revengeful. Number five, a monk is angry and stubborn. Number six, a monk is angry and utters words bordering on anger. Number seven, a monk is reproved and he resists the re reprover. Number eight, a monk is reproved and he denigrates the reprover. Number nine, a monk is reproved and he counter-reproves the reprover. Number ten, a monk is reproved and he pre prevaricates, leads the talk aside and shows anger, hate and bitterness. Number eleven, a monk is reproved and he fails to account for his conduct. Number twelve, a monk is contemptuous and domineering. Thir thirteen, a monk is envious and avaricious. 14. A monk is fraudulent and deceitful. 15. A monk is obstinate and arrogant. 16. A monk adheres to his own views, holds on to them tenaciously, and relinquishes them with difficulty. This is a quality that makes him difficult to admonish. Monks, uh, friends, these are called the qualities that make him difficult to admonish. Stop here for a while. Huh? So here there are 16 qualities. Huh? Uh, that make a uh, monk uh, difficult to admonish. La. Number one, he has evil wishes. Maybe uh, he desires to be famous. La. He wants fame la. Uh, or any other evil wish. Uh, number two, um, he lords himself, uh, dis praises himself la, and puts down others, la, disparages others. La. Ego. Number three, uh, the monk is angry. La. He cannot control, overcome by anger, cannot control his temper. La. Number four, a monk is angry and revengeful. La. If you if you admonish him, la, he might want to take revenge. La. Number five, a monk is angry and stubborn. La. Stubborn, probably doesn't want to change. La. Number six, a monk is angry and utters words bordering on anger. Uh, so, he speaks angry words back. La. Number seven, the monk is reproved and he resists the reprover. Tries to defend himself, huh? does not want to admit. Number eight, the monk is reproved and he denigrates the reprover. So when you admonish him, huh, he talks bad about you. Huh? Number nine, the monk is reproved and he counter reproves the reprover. So you, you tell him his fault, huh? he'll tell you back your fault. Huh? Ten, a monk is reproved and he prevaricates and leads the talk aside and shows anger, hate and bitterness. Uh, 
So when you when you tell him his fault, nah, he speaks or acts evasively. Lah. Number eleven, the monk is reproved and he fails to account for his conduct. Hmm. He does not want to account for his his uh, feelings. Lah. Twelve, a monk is contemptuous and domineering, hmm. Hmm. arrogant, lah, domineering. Thirteen, envious and avaricious, lah. Hmm. extremely greedy, lah. will not change. Lah. Fourteen, fraudulent and deceitful. Lah. Uh, this one is very important. If a if a if a disciple uh, is fraudulent and deceitful, uh, is he doesn't want to show his faults to the teacher, uh, then the teacher cannot make him improve. Uh. A person uh, who wants to learn, who wants to improve, uh, progress on the spiritual path, uh, he has got to be very straightforward. Uh, whatever faults he has, uh, he has got to expose them to the teacher, uh, not 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 be deceitful. Uh. Fifteen, obstinate and arrogant, stubborn and haughty. Sixteen, adheres to his own views, holds on to them tenaciously. Will not change his views. You tell him his, his, his wrong views, he will not change. So these are the qualities. If a monk possesses these qualities, then his companions in the holy life would not want to admonish him because he doesn't want to be admonished, he doesn't want to improve. And Venerable Maha Moglana continues, Friends, though a monk does not ask us, let the Venerable Ones admonish me. I need to be admonished by the Venerable Ones. Yet, if he is easy to admonish and possesses qualities that make him easy to admonish, if he is patient and takes instruction rightly, then his companions in the holy life think that he should be admonished and instructed, and they think of him as a person to be trusted. Hmm. What qualities make him easy to admonish? Here a monk has no evil wishes and is not dominated by evil wishes. This is a quality that makes him easy to admonish. Again, a monk does not laud himself nor disparage others. Number three, he is not angry nor allows anger to overcome him. Four, he is not angry or revengeful. Five, not angry or stubborn. Six, not angry and does not utter words bordering on anger. 7. When reproved, he does not resist the reprover. When reproved, he does not denigrate the reprover. When reproved, he does not counter reproof. He is reproved and he does not prevaricate, lead the talk aside and show anger, hate and bitterness. When reproved, he does not fail to account for his conduct, as he explains himself. 12. He is not contemptuous or domineering. 13. He is not envious or avaricious. 14. He is not fraudulent or deceitful. 15. He is not obstinate or arrogant. Again, a monk does not adhere to his... 16. He does not adhere to his own views or hold on to them tenaciously and he relinquishes them easily. This is a quality that makes him easy to admonish. Friends, these are called the qualities that make him easy to admonish. Stop here for a moment. So here the... Converse, uh, um, if a monk uh, is easy to admonish, uh, makes himself admonishable, uh, then uh, other monks uh, uh, observe uh, that he is willing to be uh, reproved, uh, willing to change, uh, then the other monks uh, will uh, want to help him uh, and tell him his faults. Uh. Now friends, a monk ought to infer about himself in the following way. 1. A person with evil wishes and dominated by evil wishes is displeasing and disagreeable to me. If I were to have evil wishes and be dominated by evil wishes, I would be displeasing and disagreeable to others. A monk who knows this should arouse his mind thus, I shall not have evil wishes and be dominated by evil wishes. Similarly, for the other qualities, huh? uh, he thinks huh, if... Uh, he has, uh, if a person has these um, evil qualities, uh, then uh, he is displeasing. Uh, and if he himself has these qualities, uh, he is also displeasing to the others. Uh, so he changes, uh, uh, does not allow himself uh, to have these evil qualities. Uh. So for a person to change himself, uh, first he has to acknowledge uh, he has these, these faults. Uh. If a person is not willing to admit your faults, uh, you will never improve. Uh, so when another person uh, tells you your fault, uh, you should not try to defend yourself, uh, but uh, 
uh, in the Buddha's uh, teachings, uh, that we should be uh, willing to accept criticism, uh, to consider uh, whether uh, what people say about us uh, is reasonable or not. Uh, and he continues. Now, friends, a monk should review himself thus. Do I have evil wishes and am I dominated by evil wishes? If when he reviews himself, he knows I have evil wishes, I am dominated by evil wishes, then he should make an effort to abandon those evil and wholesome states. But if when he reviews himself, he knows I have no evil wishes, I am not dominated by evil wishes, then he can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome states. Again, a monk should review himself thus, do I praise myself and disparage others? Do I adhere to my own views, hold on to them tenaciously, uh, etc. So when he re reviews uh, himself, uh, then he knows uh, that he does not have, uh, if he has these uh, uh, evil qualities, uh, then he should make an effort to abandon those unwholesome states. Uh, and if he does not have them, uh, then he can be happy and glad, uh, training day and night, uh, to develop wholesome states uh, and abandon unwholesome states. Uh. Friends, when a monk reviews himself thus, if he sees that these evil unwholesome states are, are not all abandoned in himself, then he should make an effort to abandon them all. But if when he reviews himself thus, he sees that they are all abandoned in himself, then he can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome states. This is when a woman or a man, young, youthful, fawn of ornaments, on viewing the image of her own face in a clear, bright mirror or in a basin of clear water, sees a smudge or a blemish on it. She makes an effort to remove it. But if she sees no smudge or blemish on it, she becomes glad thus. It is again for me that it is clean. So too, when a monk reviews himself thus, then he can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome states. This is what the Venerable Maha Mughalana said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Venerable Maha Mughalana's words. That's the end of the sutta. So here you see a uh, uh, senior monk like the Venerable Maha Mughalana, he's trying to advise the younger monks uh, how to improve themselves. Uh. There's one thing uh, very good uh, about these suttas. Uh, they're all very practical. Uh, very practical. And uh, if you uh, study them and... Uh, you find uh, that you can use them uh, to improve yourself uh, and progress on the spiritual path. Uh, this is what the spiritual path is about, uh, to change our character for the better. Uh, uh. Even if you are not a monk, uh, you are for lay people. Uh, if you change yourself for the better, uh, then you find uh, that your life is well lived uh, at the end of your life. Uh, when you are about to pass away, uh, then you don't have remorse, you don't uh, uh, be depressed about yourself. Okay, the next sutta, number 16, Cheto Kila Sutta, the wilderness in the heart. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. There he addressed the monks thus, Monks, Venerable Sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this, Monks, that any monk who has not abandoned five wildernesses in the heart and has not severed five shackles in the heart should come to growth, increase and fulfillment in this Dhamma Vinaya. This is impossible. What monks are the five wildernesses in the heart that he has not abandoned? Here a monk is doubtful, uncertain, undecided and unconfident about the teacher. And thus his mind does not incline to ardor, devotion, perseverance and striving. As his mind does not incline to ardor, devotion, perseverance and striving, that is the first wilderness in the heart that he has not abandoned. Stop here for a moment. Here, this first one is doubtful, unconfident about the teacher. This teacher here refers to the Buddha in the, in the, in the monks. For the monks during the Buddha's time, eh, the only teacher eh, is the Buddha. Mm. Again, a monk is doubtful, uncertain, undecided and unconfident about the Dhamma. 
as his mind does not incline to ardor. That is the second wilderness in the heart that he has not abandoned. Again, a monk is doubtful, uncertain, undecided and unconfident about the Sangha. As his mind does not incline to ardor, that is the third wilderness in the heart that he has not abandoned. Again, a monk is doubtful, uncertain, undecided and unconfident about the training. As his mind does not incline to ardor, that is the fourth wilderness in the heart that he has not abandoned. Stop you for a moment. Nah? So here, uh, first one is uh, doubtful about the Buddha. Second, doubtful about the Dhamma. Third, doubtful about the Sangha. Fourth, doubtful about the training. The tra training here uh, normally refers to the training of Sila, Samadhi and Panya. Moral conduct, concentration and wisdom. You can also say this is a training in the Noble Eightfold Path. Mm -hmm. Again, the monk is angry and displeased with his companions in the holy life, resentful and callous towards them. And thus his mind does not incline to ardor, devotion, perseverance and striving. As his mind does not incline to ardor, devotion, perseverance and striving, that is the fifth wilderness in the heart that he has not abandoned. These are the five wildernesses in the heart that he has not abandoned. Uh, so here, so here the last one, uh, is angry and displeased with his companions in the holy life. You know? uh, a monk, uh, he should have good relationship uh, uh, with his uh, fellow monks uh, so that uh, they can help him and he can help them. And uh, helping each other, uh, they can progress on the spiritual path. If, uh, as a monk, uh, uh, the Buddha says, uh, we... A uh, monk has renounced. Uh, he does not have a mother or a father to look after him. If he, if, if monks do not look after themselves, uh, who is going to look after them? Uh, so, uh, having uh, friendship uh, with other monks uh, is uh, quite important. What monks are the five shackles in the heart that he has not severed? Here, a monk is not free from lust, desire, affection, thirst, fever, and craving for sensual pleasures. And thus his mind does not incline to other devotion, perseverance, and striving. As his mind does not incline to other devotion, perseverance, and striving, that is the first shackle in the heart that he has not severed. Again, a monk is not free from lust, desire, affection, thirst, fever, and craving for the body. As his mind does not incline to other devotion, perseverance, that is the second shackle in the heart that he has not severed. Again, the monk is not free from lust, desire, affection, thirst, fever and craving for form. As, as his mind does not incline to other devotion, perseverance and striving. That is the third shackle in the heart that he has not severed. Stop here for a moment. Now. So here, the five shackles. Huh? The first one is craving for sensual pleasures. The second one is sensual pleasures means uh, craving for uh, pleasurable sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and touch. Mm. And uh, the second one is craving for the body. Here, craving but for the body refers to his own body. Mm. Uh, vain about his body uh, and uh, all that. And the third one is craving for form. Here, craving for form probably refers to other bodies. Uh, craving for other bodies. Mm especially those of the opposite sex. Eh? Uh. Again, a monk eats as much as he likes until his belly is full and indulges in the pleasure of sleeping, lolling and drowsing. As his mind does not incline to other devotion, perseverance and striving, that is the fourth shackle in the heart that he has not severed. Again, a monk lives the holy life aspiring to some order of gods. Thus, by this virtue or observance or asceticism, or holy life, I shall become a great God or some lesser God. And thus his mind does not incline to other devotion, perseverance and striving. As his mind does not incline to other devotion, perseverance and striving, this is the fifth shackle in the heart that he has not severed. These are the five shackles in the heart that he has not severed. Monks, that any monk who has not abandoned these five wildernesses in the heart and, and severed these five shackles in the heart, should come to growth, increase and fulfillment in this Dhamma Vinaya. That is impossible. Dhamma, Dhamma Vinaya, you know, uh, is the teachings of the Buddha. Uh, the Dhamma, the Suttas and this, the Vinaya is the 
uh, monastic discipline for monks. Uh. So here the five shackles uh, is craving for sensual pleasures, craving for his body, craving for other bodies, and uh, eating too much. When we eat too much, uh, uh, we tend to become sleepy. Uh. If, we, if we are fat, uh, we tend to to want to sleep more. But the more we sleep, uh, the more we want to sleep. Uh. So uh, that's not good. Uh. If we want to uh, progress in the spiritual path, uh, we have to be a bit ascetic. Uh. Just sleep the minimum that we need. Uh. We sleep too little uh, also. Um, you won't uh, progress. Uh. You sleep too much also. So you have to know what is the minimum you require. Uh. Mm. And then the last one is uh, living the holy life, uh, aspiring to be some god, uh, deva, uh, so that uh, you have a good life. Uh, uh, so that being the case, uh, you're not inclined to strive very hard in the, in the holy life. Uh. So these are the five shackles. Uh. Monks, that any monk who has abandoned five wildernesses in the heart and severed five shackles in the heart should come to growth, increase and fulfillment in this Dhamma Vinaya. That is possible. What monks are the five wildernesses in the heart that he has abandoned? Here a monk is not doubtful, uncertain, undecided or, or unconfident about the teacher and thus his mind inclines to other devotion, perseverance and striving. As his mind inclines to other devotion, perseverance and striving, the first wilderness in the heart has been abandoned by him. Again, a monk is not doubtful, uncertain, undecided or unconfident about the Dhamma. Number three, uh, again, a monk is not doubtful, uncertain, undecided or unconfident about the Sangha. Number four, again, a monk is not doubtful, uncertain, undecided or unconfident about the training. Number five, again, a monk is not angry and displeased with his companions in the holy life, nor resentful and careless towards them. And thus his mind inclines to other devotion, perseverance and striving. As his mind inclines to other devotion, perseverance and striving, the fifth wilderness in the heart has been abandoned by him. These are the five wildernesses in the heart that he has abandoned. What monks are the five shackles in the heart that he has severed? Here a monk is free from lust, desire, affection, thirst, fever and craving for sensual pleasures and thus his mind inclines to other devotion, perseverance and striving. As his mind inclines to other devotion, perseverance and striving, the first shackle in the heart has been severed by him. Again a monk is free from lust, desire, affection, thirst, fever and craving for the body. Number three, again a monk is free from lust, desire, affection, thirst, fever and craving for form. That means other bodies. Huh? Number four, again a monk does not eat as much as he likes until his belly is full and does not indulge in the pleasures of sleeping, lolling and drowsing. Uh, number five, again a monk does not live the holy life aspiring to some order of God's thus by this virtue or observance or asceticism or holy life. I shall become a great God or some lesser God. And thus his mind inclines to other devotion, perseverance and striving. As his mind inclines to other devotion, perseverance and striving, the fifth shackle in the heart has been severed by him. These are the five shackles in the heart that he has severed. Monks, that any monk who has abandoned these five wildernesses in the heart and severed these five shackles in the heart should come to growth, increase and fulfillment in this Dhamma Vinaya. That is possible. Uh, stop here for a moment. So here, uh, the converse uh, for a monk uh, uh, is to uh, not have these five wildernesses uh, or these five shackles uh, in the heart. Uh, and then he can progress uh, on the spiritual path. He develops the basis for psychic power consisting in concentration of desire and determined striving. He develops the basis for psychic power consisting in concentration of energy and determined striving. He develops the basis for psychic power consisting in concentration of mind and determined striving. He develops the basis for psychic power consisting in concentration of investigation and determined striving. And enthusiasm is the fifth. Monks, uh, a monk who thus possesses the 15 factors including enthusiasm is capable of breaking out 
capable of enlightenment, capable of attaining the supreme security from bondage. Let's we'll stop here for a moment. Uh. So these last five things, uh, uh, four of them uh, is the four idipada, uh, the um, basis uh, for psychic power. Uh, uh, and uh, the fifth one, uh, the Buddha has en- uh, added, uh, is enthusiasm. Uh. Uh, enthusiasm uh, to strive uh, in the holy life. Uh. Uh. So, 15 factors means the five wildernesses, uh, the five shackles, uh, the four bases of psychic power, uh, idipadas, uh, plus enthusiasm, uh, that would be 15. Uh. Mm. Suppose there were a hen with 8, 10 or 12 eggs, which she had covered, incubated and nurtured properly. Even though she did not wish, oh, that my chicks might pierce their shells, with the points of their claws and beaks, and hatch out safely. Yet the chicks are capable of piercing their shells with the points of their claws and beaks, and hatching out safely. So too, a monk who thus possesses the 15 factors, including enthusiasm, is capable of breaking out, capable of enlightenment, capable of attaining the supreme security from bondage. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were just satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Uh, so here, the Buddha is saying uh, that uh, if a person wants to become enlightened, uh, he must not have these five wildernesses in the heart, uh, or the five shackles in the heart. Uh, and then uh, he should have the four idipadas, the four bases of psychic power, uh, which means uh, determines striving uh, and concentration of desire, concentration of energy, concentration of mind and concentration of investigation. Investigation means investigation of the Dhamma uh, plus enthusiasm to strive. Uh, so when you, you don't have these uh, unwholesome states of, of wildernesses and shackles uh, and you make great effort uh, when you're enthusiastic to strive on the spiritual path, uh, then uh, it is possible to in, become enlightened. Uh, so this is another uh, sutta. Uh.